going on? This is Nubia. And I'm Francis. And welcome to Chronicles of Pride. Today we're chatting it up with Natalie from Beautiful Booze, an award-winning resource for cocktail enthusiasts, professional bartenders, brands, and travelers alike. Natalie turned her passion for cocktails, entertaining, and global adventures into one of the top booze and travel accounts in the U.S., Beautiful Booze highlights unique libations, brands, and experiences in every corner of the world through her beautifully laid out website and social media platforms. So Natalie, thank you for taking time to chat with us and welcome to Chronicles of Pride. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. I have to tell you, girl, you are living the life. I love me a good craft cocktail. (laughs) I was like, she's going to spend this whole time talking about how much of a lust she is. I know it. It's coming. Like, this is such a well, unique spin. I love it. Yeah, I mean, it's been a whirlwind, that's for sure. I mean, when you think about, I don't know, taking photos of cocktails and being able to turn that into a job, that sounds like that's not even an option. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's still crazy to me after six years of starting this. It's amazing. And, you know, it's a true testament of doing what you love and turning it into your career. We focus on creating your own reality. So I want to applaud you on that. So let's before we start, like, let's um, go back a little bit. So you decided in 2013 to leave your career job. Tell me, what were you doing in your career and what made you say enough is enough? I want to kind of do this. Well, essentially, I'm not, I wasn't then a huge risk taker. So um, I previously worked at universities under grants, so public health grants. Um, I have a lot of experience in education programs and actually training people during pandemics, which is interesting because that's what's going on in the world now. Um, But um, I got laid off. And honestly, I like my job because I saw, a lot of the stuff that we did impact people immediately. So actually that was hard to leave something that was so focused on helping people and giving them resources. So I got laid off because our funding got cut, our grants got cut. And basically I had to leave that job or I may still be sitting there, but like the whole thing about this is trying to take risk. And I probably wouldn't had the nerve to do it when I think back about it. it would, it's just one of those things when people say the timing is right. The timing for me right then was right, but I had no idea when I got laid off, like, what can I do? That's you know, a lot that's of a lot stores. of our stories yeah. too, right, Francis? Uh-huh. I was going to say, because I started my journey abroad when I got laid off, you know, and it's kind of like when you get laid off, a lot of people think that you, you know, have to start searching for a new job and it's not the right time to do something new right but it's the it's the right time the universe is like <laughs> go out yeah. there and and, and and find your passion and your purpose and make it happen you know and it's kind of like so it's great to hear the fact that that you have very something similar so walk us through that phase you get laid mm-hmm. off what are you feeling like and how does it get started with beautiful booze i mean I mean, I totally agree with you. I think the society in general here in the U.S. are like, okay, so you should be applying for jobs. You need to go to the next one and the next one. And honestly, I had been doing this public service job for around 12 years in different capacities. And I was just like, I don't want to. Like, I went to job interviews and I actually got one. And they literally call me back and they're like, well, you don't have the best experience of all of our candidates, but we really thought that you blended with the team well, but you acted like in the interview, you really didn't care if you got it or not. (laughs) And I think that makes people very transparent. Like when you go in and you interview and you really want the job, I mean, it's terrifying to interview with people. And I think when you feel like, you know what, I really have nothing to lose that pressure comes off. So you're anyway, so that's kind of what happened for me. And I thought, well, right now I'm going to take a creative break. Like I had some money saved up. I just, I don't know. I just loved making drinks and entertaining people. And I had worked for a food blogger and she had created this thirsty Thursday. And she was like, do you want to create the cocktails for this? And I was like, yeah, but I wasn't, 
I definitely wasn't doing any photography or anything like that. And then I thought to myself, well, she's a food blogger. There's food bloggers out here that aren't necessarily chefs, but I didn't see that in the actual cocktail world. And I thought, well, I'm not a bartender, but I'm going to just start doing this. I'm just going to start taking photos of cocktails and putting them on social media. And a lot of that, what I didn't realize as something that does start as a hobby, that most of it turned from, you know, the hobby, creating the cocktails, going through flavors, learning about spirits. It was actually marketing myself. I had no idea that that was actually what this was going to turn into. So I did after the fact when I was like, you know, I'm just going to try to ride this train as long as I can start deep diving in how to do like Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, learning all of those social media platforms that I was on personally, but I wasn't, you know, I post a photo here and there, but nothing like building a business or a marketing strategy or branding. That's that. I mean, I think that's amazing. And we were just talking earlier about how when you open yourself up, because a lot of people think they don't have skill sets, but then if they open themselves up, they stumble upon these things because I think a lot of people, before they even start something, they're like, oh, but I got to learn this and I can't, I, I can't learn something new. You know, the whole can't teach an old dog new tricks kind of thing, which stops them from creating and redesigning their lives and reinventing themselves. And you could have easily said that, right? You could have been like, I don't know anything about all these social media platforms. You said, I'm not a bartender, but I like making drinks. And so it's like, you just pretty much dove right in. And because of the fact that you stepped over that fear and just worked with that fear, you've created this amazing brand for yourself. Yeah, I do think on that note, I did go through one of those phases where I was like, okay, I'm creating this blog and I spent hours and hours and hours. And then I just got to the point where I was like, if I keep just focusing on this blog, it's actually going to bring me down. If not everything is perfect, I have to let that go because it can be a real setback. So if I would have waited till my blog was like perfect to put anything on it, I would not be here right now. It's like you've just got to go and you've just got to try to put the stuff out there. And you know, it's like people that do a lot of videos and stuff. Yeah, your first time is not going to be perfect. Maybe you hate the photo, but if you just start putting it out there, putting yourself out there, you, you just start growing, people start responding. You can build that community without every single thing being perfect. And I do think that holds a lot of people back. Yo, honestly, that was perfect because we try so hard to convey the message to just do it. Just try. You know, when we started Chronicles Abroad, we knew nothing about podcasting. Absolutely nothing. But we allowed the analysis of the analysis to oh, what paralyze us. You know what I'm trying to say? Analysis, analysis paralysis. paralysis. <laughs> I can't speak right now. Analysis paralysis happened because we wanted it to be so perfect. We wanted the right equipment. We wanted this. Mm. We wanted that. And then finally, it really got to a point. And I remember Francis and I were in Vietnam and we were like, F it. We just need to record. You know, we're yeah. so busy reading articles. We're so busy taking notes. We're so busy talking about what we want to do. And we're so busy thinking of all this stuff when we hadn't recorded nothing at that time. <laughs> so from the point of bringing up the idea to the point of actually doing a record, I think it took us like four months. It was long. It was like about six months. That we were just Which is like, crazy. It was, Yeah. And then we were on information overload. So I totally loved the fact that you were like, listen, if I would have thought, you know, I needed everything to be perfect, but can I just tell you, your website is beautifully done, girl. It Thank is you. gorgeous. So have you ever, like, looked back at, you know, when you started maybe in 2013, 2014, to now, and been like, damn, I came a long way? <laughs> Yeah, well, I can definitely look at the technology and specifically cameras that I purchase on receipts and see that, yeah, it's it's come a long way. <laughs> Just trying to build the business and have enough money to purchase some, you know, better equipment to progress. But obviously, I'm not going to say just that because I don't think you have, again, I don't think you have to have a very expensive camera to get started, but it's just the progression Yes. Um, I 
just took photos. This is going to sound super weird, but um, because I didn't have that many skills in photography, I just took photos on two baking sheets like that were stacked up on each other, like one in the back and one in the front. And so I've actually met people in person and they're like, where's the baking sheets? And I'm like, I had to progress beyond that. I'm sorry. Like I, I put those in my suitcase when I first left to start traveling in 2015 and they got warped and they were nightmare. The wind would blow. The one on top would blow the cocktail over. No, I had to progress beyond the baking sheets. And I also used to just post and share recipes of cocktails, which that's what I, that's my core. That's what I continue to do. But as time went on, I started seeing on Instagram, there was a lot of repost accounts. And I mean, you probably see that as well. And I really had to put, you know, kind of show myself and my audience was like, Oh, where are pictures of you? And you really have to set your account apart and see that there is a person behind all of this. So for me, that was really important for my audience and for the cocktail space to be able to do that, to really stand apart from other people that were doing repost accounts and just for my audience to be able to connect in that way. Yeah, so, that's yeah. great. That's great. Remember, Francis on yeah. your social media? I looked at her so oh, I, was, I, never hell showed hell my, I didn't like to show my face. And then oh, she had I had a bunch of quotes and I was wonderful like, quotes, but she was <laughs> never on our social media. And I was just like, you know, we have an audience and our, you know, the, our audience is one is going to want to see you. And then she started slowly but surely posting pictures of herself. And now, you know, she understands that because as, when you grow an audience, yeah, they want to have a face behind the brand. And you are your brand. So that's a great key. Can you tell me, though, what were the baking sheets for? <laughs> so essentially, I, they were a neutral background Um like almost they almost looked like you could scroll back on my Instagram, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, you, but um, they almost look like concrete and that silver really is a reflective surface. So it was easy to photograph bright cocktails because the back when shooting cocktails, like a lot of times when you see food, it's shot top down. So you just have to worry about the bottom surface. But like with a cocktail, you're going to see everything in the background. And so for me, I didn't have like a perfectly styled space. I could put cocktails on and shoot them. Yes, that would be ideal. And even six years later, I don't have that because I'm constantly in movement. But I've adapted to be able to, you know, better my photography skills to shoot decent looking photos that don't have to have a baking sheet in the background you got creative which is what you yeah. do when when you know when you really want to make something happen uh but i'm curious this is a good segue so in 2015 you decided to go abroad when did you incorporate the travel into your life and, and why did you do that so i was obviously um based in seattle at that time for two years uh two years trying to grow beautiful booze, but the cost of living was very expensive. And I know this seems extreme for people, but I really had no ties. I wasn't getting any work specifically from Seattle. So I felt like, you know, I want to visit distilleries. I want to see where spirits are made. I want to see what bartenders around the world are doing and try to incorporate that. And actually the bottom of the bottom line for me was making that move for a financial reason, because I felt like if I moved initially to Guatemala. I felt like if I stay in Seattle, I'm going to have to get another job to try to do this. I won't be able to grow the business as much. If I move, I'm able to totally focus on growing the business without financial constraints, which was really important for me. That makes complete sense, you know, because a lot of times people don't understand when you lose your job or whatever, you know, each day that you stay in the States is like two or three months abroad. Mm -hmm. Like literally, you know, the amount of money that you spend on rent one month can pretty much pay for your apartment for two, three months in another country mm -hmm. that works, you know, well with what you're, what you're trying to do. And going to a place like Guatemala is not far from the U.S., you know what I mean? It's still considered um, Latin America, Central America, and it's not far from the U.S., and I don't think a lot of times people understand that. When they think abroad, they think, like, 
all the way over to Asia, Africa, you know, different places that you can't necessarily attain easily, you know, but there's a whole nother world. I'm in Mexico and that's only a few hours flight from you, depending on where you are in the States, you know? So let's, let's, when did you realize that you had something going? Like, when was you like, aha, this could actually be a career? At what point? I'm trying, I mean, I felt like there was nothing out there on the, in the world like this, just because when I first started this, I would look, I was just like, the reason I started it is because when I looked in the internet, there wasn't, there was a lot of cocktail recipes, mainly by bartenders, a lot of bad looking cocktails. And I just thought cocktails need more respect than this. I mean, I get it. It may taste good, but people are enticed to make something at home that looks really good. And also there were no super simplistic cocktails that people didn't feel intimidated to make at home. So that was really my goal of this. And then, you know, I think like six months down the road, I got a couple of like writing gigs and then I was running another company, social media. And I felt like on a personal level, um, moving to Guatemala, I would be able to live off that amount of money, but I had, I still wasn't sure how I would make money specifically doing this, but I knew I had enough money on a monthly basis at the time to make it work for myself financially. And then I would try to focus on building the brand. Um, and then here and there I would get one off projects with different brands. Like I had got a bloody Mary, a partnership like December, 2015, which, you know, I did abroad and turned out well. And I just started picking up more and more of those one-off projects with brands. And actually I thought when I started getting um, sponsorships by huge like alcohol brands, I was like, well, this is something. But I do believe it took me a long time to get to that point, obviously. Brands were just sending me free bottles to do content. So I did at that time have to work a lot for free to build up my profile where it did get some traction for business purposes. It was getting a lot of traction from the audience standpoint. Like I kept growing, 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 um, on Instagram. And so, you know, when more of the sponsorship stuff started coming in, I felt like, okay, maybe I can make this work for another year and another year and another year. But yes, I was very, very scared because again, I was in a government jobs for 12 years. It was very secure. I had benefits. And so this was very scary to try to make that financial change. So a lot of it was about trying to think how I can deal with my anxiety of trying to start a business, being from being a person that never said, I want to have my own business. Because a lot of people grow up saying, or a lot of people you know, my age, I'm going to open this. I've always wanted to be my own business owner. I was never like that. I was like, I just want to be in a safe and secure place. Well, this is definitely out of my comfort zone. And I, I just took it and I thought, you know, what's, I just played that worst case scenario in my head. What's the worst case scenario? Okay. I fail and I have to go back to a government job. That didn't seem like a big deal. So let me ask you something, a unique question, uh, because, you know, we we come across a lot of entrepreneurs who, you know, trying to really make a name for themselves. And you just said you were in a safe, secure 12 year job. And then you went into this kind of unstable, uncertain, uh, you know, profession. It's like, how did you deal with like the money mindset stuff? Because for a lot of entrepreneurs, they're always thinking about like, I can't make the money or there's not enough money or because part of that being an entrepreneur is having a very strong money mindset. Like, how were you able to develop a strong money mindset and that led you to some of these profitable brands and everything else? And can I just piggyback off of what you just said, Francis? Because in the beginning, you're actually buying these cocktails to take the pictures, right? Mm -hmm. So especially, you know, if people living in the States, I lived in Washington, D.C., so a cocktail was $15. If I lost my job, I couldn't spend $15 at different places taking pictures for free. You get what I'm saying? So... Again, to answer Francis's question, you know, you had to pay money in order to start this business. So how did you get into that mindset? 
Yeah, I mean, I think my first big purchase was I got somebody to help me with the website after like a couple months. And I and I justify it in my head just by saying, you know, it's not like I'm starting this company with a brick and mortar where I have to pay rent. So I'm just trying to invest in myself because I did have a bit of savings after being in a consistent job for a while. But, you know, I... I still have a ton of anxiety about the money. Like even now, I mean, obviously the current situation is weird, but even before that every single day, and I feel like that's what pushes me. If I'm like scared to reach out to a brand, like you have to, I think a lot of it is for me is the fear, but because the money part is like, I have to make money to survive. I think a lot of that gets wiped away. And I'm like, I have nothing to lose. So I'm going to reach out to this brand. I'm going to pitch them a new idea. I'm going to see what happens. And a lot of that was investing my in myself, going to different conferences and stuff where I can meet people in person was huge for me because being able to make contacts with contacts with brands in person, I feel like really helped them remember me when a project specifically came up. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, hard to invest in yourself, especially in a new business when you don't have a lot of money. And that's why I did something that I obviously not everyone can do is pack up your stuff and go volunteer in a hostel in Guatemala. So you don't have any expenses at all. But I wanted to make this work so bad that I just eliminated everything. I just eliminated everything. And in my head, it's not, it's still not an easy process. I mean, not having the security of a home is something that is difficult on a daily basis to deal with, but it's just a different way of living. And I feel like it's made me a better person because I'm able to adapt to a ton of different situations that I'm put into, whether it's a personal issue of like, oh my God, like, I don't know, I'm in a city and they've run out of all hotel rooms or whatever, just having travel crises or crises in life, they don't seem as huge as they would have in my previous life because, you know, I'm just living day to day instead of, you know, planning five years in advance, which some people would, would not agree with me because a lot of successful people have five year and 10 year plans. And I, I also have some goals for myself with that, but it is hard for me to see years, you know, in, into the future when I want to concentrate on my, what my business is doing today. Things are rapidly changing, opportunities mm-hmm. come up. Um, so, you know, I'm trying every day to make my business better and myself better, but I'm, I'm looking to the future, but I'm not going to stress about the future and stress about the money, even though it is difficult because you want to have projects lined up. And sometimes that can be hard to be able to find the right contacts and do that. Well, I mean, let's just be clear, right? You brought up successful people who have these long-term goals or plans, but guess what? Every successful person took risk. If they didn't take risk and invest about to say that, yeah. That's what it's yeah, about. It's all about risk taking. It's all about risk taking. I mean, Mark Zuckerman, you know what I'm saying? Zuckerberg or Zuckerman is Zuckerberg. Child. Is it? <laughs> she does this <laughs> messing up someone else's name. Really? Facebook? Yeah, Facebook. I mean, it was an idea. I mean, they were college students. It ain't like he had a whole Zuckerberg. bunch of capital. Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg, yeah. whatever. You know what I'm saying? I mean, look at um what's his name? Microsoft dude. Bill Gates. Okay. Bill Gates. He's now retiring from Microsoft after all these years, but he was also a college student at the time and just took risk. I mean, we, if you look at every successful person, that's what they did. They invested in themselves and they took a risk and their risk paid off. Did they pay off immediately? No, it took a couple of years to grow it. it could, I, think, I think that's the problem with America sometimes is that we want instant and immediate gratification. And yes, that could happen from time to time, but it's not the way. It's like you do have to put in the work, but as long as you are passionate about it and you have a true sense of like, you know, go getter kind of attitude, people see that and they gravitate towards it and it continues to help leverage and, you know, grow your business. And that one on one connection, we were just talking about networking. Networking is huge. Mm-hmm. 
you know, it's a huge thing. But. Yeah, I mean, everything is relationship building. Um, it was something I was going to say, and I just totally... Well, I, I also think in my case, you know, a lot of people in the bar industry or people that find my account or even people that I meet in person, they'll like look at my Instagram account and they'll be like, how in the hell did you get this many followers? And it's like, well, I mean, I've been on Instagram all day, every day since 2013. Shouldn't I be at this level? Like I should be at this level if I've spent this much time. But to the instant gratification, people think all of a sudden I just started this yesterday and now I have all these followers. No, like this took six years to get to this point and people just think it's this overnight like, oh, you just put up a bunch of cocktails yesterday and bought a bunch of followers and now you're on top. No, that's not. Yeah, because people see the outcome, outcome, right? They see the outcome. Yeah. They don't see the behind the scenes of you spending staying up late till two, three o'clock in the morning, or sometimes even till four or five o'clock in the morning, getting content out, building out strategies, you know, while also being nomadic, which also poses a lot of, you know, difficulties and challenges within itself. And I'm curious to just find out more about, you know, what's it been like for you to be nomadic, to go from a such a secure lifestyle to now like going from country to country, hostel to hostel, that sort of thing. And how that has impacted just your overall lifestyle? I mean, originally I had a storage unit because I did have a lot of stuff. And then each like six months, if I went back to Seattle, I kept making that storage unit smaller to the point where I was like, I never used any of this stuff. Like I don't need it. Not only is like the traveling abroad, like one thing, but it's also a little bit of a life changer just in your attitude towards stuff and that's the one thing that people get fixated on that always talk to me they just cannot get past the stuff they're like but where's your stuff like I need stuff and I'm like I have one suitcase and I said to be honest half of that is bartending equipment and photography equipment and I have very little stuff and they just cannot handle it. I don't know what it is. They look at me like you're all out of your freaking mind. Like where's your stuff? So it did, honestly, it did take phases of that. It's, it's not something that can just, for me, that could just happen overnight. I couldn't just get rid of all my stuff and say, I'm out of here. It, it just, it mentally, it took a little bit um, for me to come to grips with that. But The hardest thing for me is actually creating the content, uh, being nomadic because sometimes I can't find the specific alcohol that they would be mailing to me if I was in the U S then I have to try to figure out where I can go find glassware. And this seems all trivial, but it is, it's the, it's the way that I make money. So it is difficult. Um, than just finding ingredients. And being nomadic, people think they see the final product again and go, oh my God, this is amazing. But it's also every city you go into, if you're not staying there for like a month, it's hard to know the places to go. Like it can be all day to find a lime. Like, I don't know, maybe they don't even have limes. So it's trying to adapt to that. But I also had to put some things in place and rely on some people here in the U.S. Like my, I grateful to have my cousin who is a photographer that photographs humans and she helps me with projects that I'm just not able to do because um in the U.S. we drink the most booze in the world and so a lot of products that you'll be able to have access to here you just will not be able to abroad so I she helps me with that otherwise I would not be able to take on a lot of projects and that having her help me and pay her money is helps that kind of stress drip away yeah. from my mind because I, I needed that imagine. backup. I can only imagine because I'm a nomad and I love bourbon and that's one of the alcohols that I cannot find outside mm-hmm. of the U.S. as much is bourbon. Oh, they love whiskey, but then it's the trash whiskey. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. It's like it's never top quality stuff. So whenever I get to a country that actually has top quality stuff, I'm like, ah, yay! You know, I, you know, so I know the passion for a good cocktail and it's not easy to find all over the world. You know, right. some, some countries are, are better than others. 
What's your favorite cocktail? What do you first? What do you like to consume? And then what is your the one that you like to make? Well, my, so I, I'll tell you guys this. When I first moved abroad, I didn't do a ton of the travel stuff because I was nervous that if brands saw me outside of the U.S., they wouldn't want to work with me. They would say, hmm, she's not in the U.S., so I'm going to find somebody else. So I'm just going to put that out there. But then I started incorporating more travel after I just said, you know, whatever, I'm just going to do this because there was all this content and bartenders and different people doing different stuff. And I was just like, I have a content opportunity here that nobody else is going to have. So I just said, I'm going to do it. And you know what? That was my fear because brands kept coming to me. But what I started doing is this destination daiquiri because daiquiris are my favorite cocktail. And there's it's the reason is, is it's simplistic. It's fresh lime juice, sugar, and rum. That's it. It's three ingredients. It's easy. Um, and you know, bartenders, when I ask for that, they get super creative and put in a local ingredient. And I, and that's, That's super fun for me. So that's my favorite cocktail and just, you know, easy, super easy. And so I got bartenders to make me different destination daiquiris. So it was just a fun way to incorporate that. Um, As far as what I like to make, um, you know, I, I like to try new things. So I do, I do urge people at home Sometimes cocktails can feel overwhelming and too complicated, but using like fresh citrus is the first thing that makes them really great. Just like having a margarita with fresh lime juice changes everything. So just, and also making your own simple syrup at home. I mean, it's one cup water, one cup sugar. That's super cheap, like super cheap and easy. And you can add anything to flavor that up. I mean, banana, you can make banana simple syrup if you have bananas going bad. I mean, you can make like strawberry, anything, anything that you have, cinnamon, anything. So just trying to incorporate and make twists like a daiquiri with like coconut syrup or a daiquiri with like a fun like hibiscus syrup, just incorporate, just doing easy twists. That's what I like to make. That's nice. I like it because I actually, I'm in Mexico and hibiscus is huge here. They call it Jamaica. And um, I literally bought some Jamaica dried and I was like, you know, I'm just going to make my own tea. And then I started making my own juice. And then I was like, I need to make a cocktail with all this Jamaica. And I was just thinking to myself, like, now I got to figure out how to make a nice little cocktail with it. So you, that was like right on the money because when you have a local ingredient, the first thing you think about is how can I use this in different ways to make it just for, for, for me the way I like it. So, and I just throw away two, two bananas and I didn't know that I could make a banana simple syrup. Yeah, that's a great idea because we've... We've done our own um, simple syrup to make sangrias from like you know scratch or whatnot, and it really is that simple. <laughs> it's like you don't need to buy it. It's like all those things that you don't have to buy. It's super easy, and then if you feel like oh this is a lot I, for cocktails, I mean you can just add it to water, sparkling water for people that might not want to drink. You can make, you know, non-alcoholic cocktails for them. I mean, hibiscus, they're serving that Agua del Dia, they call, you know, whatever they have uh, fresh, which is usually the Jamaica in Mexico. I mean, they're, I've, I've used that specifically as inspirations to make cocktails. So with not only has traveling helped me financially, but also get inspiration for new ideas um, on the cocktail front. Yeah, man, you learn about those little, and it's funny when you said you maybe can't find a lime, half the time you can't find a lemon, right? It's like lemons are non-existent outside of the U.S. in a lot of places, because I'll be like, you know, can I get lemon? And they're looking at me like, and I'm like, and to them, lemon or lemon is a lime. Mm -hmm. So it's like you learn so much about ingredients and how certain ingredients are not, you know, everywhere that you go. So when you're used to a certain thing, so my taste buds had to change a little bit because I can't find bourbon everywhere. I started drinking gin. Mm -hmm. You you would think that I would stay dark, but bourbon is my dark and gin is my light, Mm -hmm. you know, and gin you can typically find everywhere, but it becomes a little bit more expensive in different countries. Mm -hmm. So I learned a lot about 
the alcohol because I am somebody who enjoys a craft cocktail. If you're somebody that doesn't drink, you don't think of those things. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I agree on that. And really for my point of view, why I started this also was for people to like be able to look in their kitchen and just make stuff from what they have instead of buying all these ingredients. It's like cooking out of a cookbook, like all the photos look really beautiful and I want to make everything in there. But like, if you're looking at like a chef's cookbook, it seems very overwhelming. So that was my goal is to try to make simplistic recipes that people would actually be able to make, not necessarily going to the grocery store and purchasing a bunch of stuff and just kind of encourage people to, you know, be creative and don't think that you have to have a recipe for everything because as traveling around also, you have to be flexible. You have to have the, you have to use the ingredients you can find. And, you know, not every place is like the U S where you can get anything and everything that you've ever wanted in the produce department. Yeah. And I'm, that's a good segue into uh, the book that you have that's coming out yeah. in August. Tell us a little bit more about the beautiful booze book that you, you currently have that people can pre-order. Yeah, so the book is called Beautiful Booze, Stylish Cocktails You Can Make at Home. It's really an extension of my Instagram account. So it's really bringing my audience and people around the world to discover more cocktails and have a physical book they can look at and make drinks from and connect with their friends and their family over cocktails without scrolling through Instagram and being on your phone all the time. You can really have a party or have friends over, do easy stuff, and just be engaged with them. I love that. Love for somebody like I'm me, would need that. Yeah, because I'm an entertainer, so I am that person that's on Pinterest looking for. I have plenty of Pinterest boards for cocktail parties. And when I lived in the States, Thanksgiving for different, you know, um, seasons and stuff like that, because I am that friend that always had a cocktail for the occasion, right? So, like, you know, July 4th, we had these little uh, cocktails with the grenadine at the bottom for the Mm -hmm. red. And then I learned how to use the spoon to, you know, separate it and then put the blue, you know, um, what is it, blue contro? Is it blue? Which one's blue? Corsa, yes, on yeah. the top to make a red, white, and blue drink. You know, people love that type of stuff. I love it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're speaking so, her language right now. <laughs> you are. Yeah. Totally, like, this is my love. Food is my love language, number one. Yeah. And cocktails go along with it. I think a great yeah. meal with a good cocktail and a good dessert. Any time, man, listen, that is the way to move All of the heart. above. Yeah. All of the above. A good cocktail, some food, and a good dessert. But I just want to say your website is so beautiful. The pictures that you take, the content that you have, I recommend everybody who is listening to this podcast episode to go on to your website, beautifullyboos.com, right? Mm-hmm. And check out your content. It was it's great. We were going over it and like, we were like, damn. So filled with so much stuff. It's amazing. It's it's filled with so many great articles and beautiful pictures. So you're doing a great job. Thank you. Yeah, and thank keep you. up the great work. We hope to follow you, continue to follow you to see what else is next. So speaking of, what else is next for Natalie in Beautiful Booze? Well, right now I just put out a big thing that I'm super proud of, which was extending beyond the photos on Instagram. I did a Asia bar crawl series. And so that is really important for me because it's about combining cocktails and travel and seeing the different bartending cultures that are happening like in Asia. So I took my, I'm still in the process of posting the content, but so far I've taken my audience through, um, Tokyo, Kyoto, um, and Taipei. Singapore is up next, but The Asia bar community and their cocktail bars are just insane. Like one of the videos I posted this week was from a bar called Infinity Infinity and Beyond. And they offer high level craft cocktails, you know, inspired by space. So space cocktails. And so that place was just amazing. So I'm, you know, and it had just opened in December. So for me to be able to go and take that opportunity to show 
my audience, the creativity of bars and being able to go to like a space age bar in Taipei is, I think, super cool. So that's what I'm doing right now. And I have an extension of that bar crawl happening in Seattle and Portland as well. And I mean, I'm hoping to just keep going. So, you know, since we've upped our video production and been able to take our video skills next level, I'm excited to continue that Asia bar crawl, that same concept around the world, take that to all different kinds of countries. That's awesome. I love that. (laughs) That is so cool. Um, So Natalie, as we wrap up, and I know you just created this beautiful life for yourself. What do you have to say to those who are, you know, wanting to create that kind of lifestyle for themselves? What would you say? Because you've taken a lot of risks and it's led you to this amazing place. I, I think that one thing you have to remember is don't let boundaries stop you and that it is going to be a lot of work. I think that is a boundary for a lot of people that think, yes, you can change your life, but in order to sustain something like this and to be able to travel and, you know, make cocktails and showcase bartenders and as my platform has grown, push other people forward is very important for me as well. So I think you have to understand that it takes a lot of behind the scenes work until you may see something come out of it, but don't give up on reaching for those goals. I love it. Love it, love Don't it. Let anything love stop it. you, guys. All right, everybody, <laughs> make it happen. I swear to goodness, it's almost like every episode we've had over the um, last few weeks have been the same message. Like, just keep going. You got to start somewhere. Don't mm. try to perfect everything. Just start and continue and watch, mm. watch the, the manifestation of, yeah. happen. Watch yeah. the fruits of your labor grow, and you're a perfect love example it. of that. I love Thank it. Well, I, we hope to cross paths one day. Yeah, so seriously, and, and get a right. drink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course, typical. <laughs> I mean, I'll make you one. I mean, I usually spend about a month a year in Mexico or more. So. Mm, okay. 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 Yeah. Well, we'll definitely keep in touch. Manifestation is going to happen. happen. Make it yeah. happen. We're going to be sitting on the beaches in Mexico with a beautiful, yeah. boozy cocktail. Love, right. it. love it. Love it. Love it. Natalie, thank you so much for sharing thank your story you so with us. We truly appreciate it. And I just want to say congratulations on all your success and, and on your book. And thank we look you. forward to seeing you again soon. Yes, Have a wonderful day. Thank you.